Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're big, we're bad, and we're back with another FAC Friday. So just a couple of weeks ago, we had a FAC Friday, which is starting a mini tradition, meaning we've only done it a couple of times, of doing a guitar of the day. So, You've probably seen in the studio and you've watched videos we've done over the years and noticed that we have a lovely, very eclectic collection of guitars. I, like many of you, like beautiful, expensive things, but I also like things that sound really good and beautiful and expensive isn't always the best sounding, especially when you stick a microphone in front of it. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about some of the greatest acoustic guitar sounds of all time. And very famously, those were done on, not always, but quite often done on relatively inexpensive, if not cheap guitars. So to that end, I want to show you this. This is my Harmony 12 string, which I bought on eBay, I don't know how long ago now, maybe five or six plus years ago. And I think it was a whopping $150. And when it came to me, the neck actually was pretty bowed. So I took it to one of two guys that we use. Last week or the week before, we were talking about a guy called um, Pat from Pat's Guitars, who's really, really good. That's P A double T for anybody in the Los Angeles area. He's really wonderful. Um, but the guy I've been using for years um, is Norik Renson. He just gets super, super busy, just like Pat, super successful. Anyway, the neck was really, really badly bowed and it was steamed straight and very inexpensively. I mean, Norik Renson is very affordable. Sorry, Norik, if you're gonna get thousands of calls and sorry, Pat, if you are as well, but you guys both deserve it. That was, it was about maybe $150 because he steamed it and clamped it and, you know, dressed the frets. It was very affordable. So I ended up with this 300-ish, I can't remember the exact price, but this 300-ish dollar 12 string acoustic guitar. Now I'd taken a gamble on it a few years ago because I'd heard a Harmony 12 string and I liked it. Well, I don't just like this, I love this guitar. One of the things that is important to me is how does it sound in the track? I know that sounds really obvious, but often you get like these big boomy acoustic guitars that are really satisfying to play when you sit down because of the bass and the resonance and you stick a mic on them, unless you get very, very lucky or you come up on the higher on the strings, that boominess just overwhelms the mic. Now, of course, with miking positions, I often talk about miking the bottom of the body there. And then the 12th to 14th fret, pull back a few inches with a large diaphragm is also popular. Those two areas, we have loads of videos on miking acoustics, so we can put links below. But ultimately, the guitar, if it doesn't have too much low end resonance and has a good mid range kind of honkiness to it, sounds really quite good. One of the Rick Rubin tricks that I learned from talking to Jim Scott and other people that work with Rick is he uses small body acoustics a lot, but they don't sound tiny on the record, they just sound good. So small body acoustics can work really great as well. Anyway, we don't have a great mic sitting on this, so you're just gonna hear it through a lapel mic, but. You hear that mid-range? It doesn't boom, you hear doesn't matter how hard I play it, it has a good mid-range evenness to it. Anyway, great guitar. But of course, like all 12 strings, a raging pain in the butt to keep in tune. So 
If you're looking for a good, affordable 12 string, don't be afraid to buy a sort of, this is, I think this is a 50s or early 60s harmony, and I still see them going for a couple hundred bucks. 12 strings aren't that popular anyway. As my mother would say, a B-I-T-C-H to play, because of course, two sets of strings. You know, if you want to whiz around, they're a little, you know. Not exactly the easiest thing. I mean, you can do it. But it's not as easy as when you play a six string. There's lots of options around. Go to eBay, try out Reverb as well. I think Reverb's a bit more switched on. Everybody's there to buy and sell musical instruments. But either way, I mean, they shouldn't really be that expensive. Um, but that's my tip. The other thing I will say, and the reason why our good friend Scott Baxendale does restorations, this one he didn't restore. He probably should. I should probably send it to him. But, you know, he could do his bracing, which is magic. But the thing about them is, is this is a solid top. So what you get is you get a, a sort of one or two hundred dollar guitar that isn't a plywood top. Think about that. Really rather wonderful. Anyway, really easy to record. Sounds incredible in the track. I will say one last thing. I've done, um, I think I did two, yeah, I've done two Trevor Hall records and like two EPs with him. And Trevor always loved using that 12 string. Um, Dustin Thomas, another artist I work with, a lot of artists I work with play it, love playing it because it's a very playable 12 string and then all fall in love with the sound of it. And everybody has made me an offer to buy it. But I don't think it's unusual. I think you can find yourself like a 50s, early 60s, maybe even a early 70s um, harmony 12 string and get yourself an affordable way of getting a great 12 string sound on your next recording. All right, let's get into some questions. I like this question a lot because it's it, it, it opens up the door to a great discussion on recording. What are your tips on recording and mixing a track with only drums, guitar, and bass, making it full and keeping it interesting? The less is more is like an obvious thing to say, but in this instance, it really holds true. I would make sure when I was recording, I know you're asking about mixing as such, but when it comes to recording, like make sure you get really great close mics on the drums so you can get a close mic tone, but also get as much of the ambience of the room as possible. So what does that mean? That means you could have two distinct drum sounds. You could have a dry, you know, close mic drum sound and then bring in the ambience where you need it. Then guitars, obviously, you know, like Van Halen and a lot of other great artists, you think of Van Halen, 90% of the first album is just one guitar playing. The only time it doubles is like a couple of times and mainly only doubles when he's playing a solo because a rhythm keeps going and it goes to solo. There's a few songs where it goes rhythm into solo and then back to single guitar. I mean, that's what made Eddie so incredible. Well, it's not true. It's not, it's one of the many, many, many reasons what made why Eddie Van Halen was such an incredible guitar player. But the fact that he could hold down and carry a song with one guitar, bass, and drums, 90% of the time, just one guitar. So, obviously, the parts were interesting, the sounds were interesting. So, think of great parts. Get great, interesting sounds. But also, like Eddie did, you know, his guitar was panned to one side, and it gave this illusion of the reverb only coming out of one side, because the dry guitar was panned, mainly to the left, I believe, and so the ambience, even though it was in stereo, because it was a stereo room inside Sunset Sound, the right-hand side came through aggressively, you know, because the left-hand side had the guitar on it. The point is, is like, interesting parts, great tone, interesting use of room ambience, plate reverbs, um, plug-in reverbs, etc. mean that you can make interesting music with just three Instruments. Obviously the same thing goes for the drums, make great parts. Bass. Take the bass, use an overdrive. I did an album, one of my first albums over here that was produced, when I was playing bass on a record, was produced by Don Smith, and I used a small stone phaser pedal on the bass. And it was great. 
I had distortion, I had a phaser pedal. I also played slide on the bass. Yep, slide on the bass. And that was, you guessed it, one guitar, bass, and drums. So I actually think it's a really incredibly interesting way to work, to only use one guitar, bass, and drums, because now you can get into like really exploring parts. Look, we talked about Eddie and Van Halen, of course, but the band that we've been talking a lot about in the last you know, few weeks because of Hugh's association, Hugh Padgham's, is of course, The Police. I mean, I rest my case. I mean, most of those songs could just be carried with the one absolutely incredible guitar part that Andy Summers would put down. We've done videos this week, of course, on Every Breath You Take, and about two months ago, we did one on Message in a Bottle. Both of those songs have incredible guitar parts. I think the first one was written by Sting and the second one by Andy. They both use ninths or sus two chords, depending on whether there was a major or minor third in there, but they use very similar ideas and they are so interesting that they are a signature of the song. You cannot separate anything from that song. Any single part is integral to what makes the song so great. Whether it's Stuart Copeland's incredible drumming, Sting's incredible singing and songwriting and bass playing, and of course, Andy's incredible guitars. So I think the challenge would be if you're working with a, a only, I like the phrase only, but only three instruments, drums, bass, and guitars, is listen to those artists, listen to those bands. And go back to a lot of music of the late 70s and early 80s where, you know, they were pushing the envelope on, especially a lot of the post-punk. Look at uh, John McGeoch in, in Magazine. Look at his work in Susie and the Banshees. I mean, it's phenomenal stuff. Public Image Limited. Oh, I mean, these bands were coming up with these really angular, cool, inventive parts. And then the police, of course, bringing in elements of punk and post-punk, but also adding a little bit of ska and reggae and then sort of mixing into a little bit of new wave. The point is, is like these bands wrote huge popular songs, pop songs, songs that were on the radio all over the world that were edgy and interesting and had limited amounts of instruments with them. It was a very, very creative time. And I'm really excited that we get to talk about bands like The Police, etc., and XTC, and get to talk with their producers and their engineers. Anyway, that's what I would do. Think interesting sounds, very interesting parts, and utilize what you have on the drums. Maybe there's a section where the drums are big and huge and roomy. Maybe there's the thing where you focus on the close mics. Think about all of the things that you can do with the supposed limitations. I actually think you'll make more interesting music by having less instruments. Warren, you covered Sonarworks software. How do you prepare a mix for a mastering engineer with Sonarworks? I am currently have Sonarworks on my master chain as my last plugin. The Sonarworks software that you may be using for your speakers or for your headphones is only for you to listen to. So you will turn it off. You will bypass the plugin when you print the mix. Sonarworks works in a way that it understands the frequency response of your headphones. It understands the frequency response of your speakers in your room, how they sound in your room, because your room will affect how they sound. So it takes into account the differences of your speakers in your room, the headphones you're wearing, allowing you to hear the music in a flatter way. So that's all great, but remember that will influence your decision so you make better decisions because you're hearing a flatter, more even response than maybe the headphones or the speakers in your room are giving you. So when you send it to a mastering engineer, you mute that plugin and you print it without that on. Because most mastering engineers, at least the good ones, like the Piper Paynes or the Kim Rosens or the Adam Ayans or any of Warren Sokols, all of those great mastering engineers will be in rooms that are treated really, really well with speakers that sound phenomenal. I mean, we've been in Piper's room. She has a 
huge, beautiful pair of PMCs in a beautifully designed room at Infrasonic, you know. Pete Lyman and her work in this room and master incredible records all day. So they are going to hear in a much flatter, truer environment. That is their job, to hear it in that environment. So you don't want to influence their listening experience. You want to give them the flattest experience. And the flattest experience is you monitoring in the best way, but muting that and giving them the result of how you monitored. Does that make sense? The sonar works is affecting your headphones or your speakers in your room, giving you an even playing field so you can make great decisions on EQ and compression, but you're gonna mute that afterwards because that is the tool that makes these headphones, these speakers sound flat. And those choices you made will be carried out in a really effective way on your mix. And when you send that mix with Sonoworks disabled, bypassed, turned off, the mix they will get will be a lot truer and they'll listen to it in their much nicer, flatter room than any of us have got. Their beautifully treated, wonderful sounding room and they'll get a better, better mix to work with and master. So use it, but turn it off when you're printing. I know that sounds really obvious to so many people watching here and you're probably like, oh, Warren's saying the most obvious thing. But unfortunately, it isn't actually obvious to everybody. I've had many, many people say that. And when we're doing live streams, for instance, we don't use Sonoworks on the master bus. As much as I wouldn't mind having it on, that's gonna affect your listening experience. So the master bus would color for my headphones that I'm using, maybe cut some bass, boost some mids and all this stuff. However, you would hear through your speakers that alteration. Why would you want that? You want to hear it flat. Anyway, hope that all makes sense. It's a great simple question, but it's, it's, I'm glad you asked. How do you get mono compatible audible guitars that are still wide and nice in stereo without being too loud? Now I've done a lot of mixes online, either live streams or mixing of songs that you can check out. And what I like to do is quite a few things. If I've got one guitar or a pair of guitars and I want them to feel very wide, I do some tricks that I've learned from great engineers and producers. And one of those is Dave Jordan's trick and many other people, of taking a guitar and putting it in one speaker and then creating a reverb of it and putting it to the other speaker. So you have dry guitar over here, it's reverb pan to the other side. And that seems to just kind of separate them and push them apart from each other. Then if the guitar is doubled in a chorus, I take the dry guitar on the opposite side and then pan its reverb on the opposite side as well. So what you have is dry guitar with its reverb over there. Another good dry guitar with its reverb on the other side. And that gives you the feeling of the verb. You get the room tones, but the reverb that's sitting under the guitar on each side is the opposing guitar. And that really is rather tasty. There's no phase issues because make sure when you're using the reverb, you have it on 100% effect. There's no dry signal coming in there, slightly out of time, causing phase polarity issues. So use a completely wet reverb on opposing sides and you fold that back into mono and it will sound good. You will get no polarity issues and you'll get good, loud, beautiful sounding guitars. Now, other things you can do, I know there's a lot of people that talk about, you know, taking the guitar and delaying it ever so slightly and then panning it over to the other side. That can work. It definitely can feel a little wider but it doesn't always fold back into mono very often. If I get a pen here, I will illustrate something for you. So there is a waveform that you see in all your DAWs. Now, let's imagine this guitar here, that's the waveform on the front of the guitar, and we pan that to the left, okay? Now, on the right-hand guitar, we're going to delay it just a couple of milliseconds, a few milliseconds, bit of a mess, but hopefully you can see what's happened. Now we've delayed this a few milliseconds, okay? And that's panned over to the right. Maybe we'll push it even back a little bit further to the right. That will sound a little wider, won't it? Because they won't be hitting at the same time. However, you fold that back to mono, there's all these places. See my squiggle, my mess? These stu this stuff here 
is now completely and utterly out of phase of each other. So what you get is you get one waveform going up and down beautifully like this, and then the next one ever so slightly staggered that when you flip them back into mono or start panning them in, they start canceling each other out. And one of the biggest problems that, dis that really is affected and is the low end and the low mids, which are the big fat wide frequencies, start to disappear. And your guitar starts to sound a little thinner and weedy sounding. And you're like, well, what happened? What I do, and many other people do, is you take that delayed guitar that's over the other side and you also mess with the pitch. First of all, delay it significantly as much as you can to keep the width, but I also run a bit of detuning on it. Now you can quite simply run a chorus on it, which is one thing you can do. You could, you could put a chorus or a flanger and have like a modulation effect and that would do an amazing job. But you might not want that because it might just start to sound a little too like cheesy 80s, not cool 80s, not Andy Summers, you know, detuned, but just kind of like, a little like, a little thin and weedy. So what I tend to do is I tend to take that track and actually just detune it. Either make it go f sharp or flat, but detune the whole thing by the same amount. And then you don't get that wah, 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 warble in and out. You just get a slightly different tuning. That, when folded back into mono or panned around, actually keeps, it doesn't, doesn't actually start canceling itself out quite so easily. But also, it's more interesting. It's more interesting. It's not just taking that one guitar, delaying it ever so slightly, panning them hard left and hard right. It's take the one guitar, pan them hard left, hard and right, duplicate it, push it back ever so slightly, detune it, and now it's a more interesting sound. Last but no means least, this is a trick I absolutely love to do, and you've seen me demonstrate it on other videos, and so please hunt them out, as I'll take the DI guitar track, because often I'll print a DI, and I'll put the reverb on the DI. So you've got an amp guitar that you've recorded, or maybe it's a DI only, and you duplicate the DI, so you have a clean DI, and you have one with an amp on it, virtual amp on it, so take the virtual amp and put that on one side and then take the DI and put that on the other side and put a reverb on the DI. So what you have is you have this big fuzzy heavy rock guitar sound on one side and then you have this clean ambient reverb which is being triggered from the same source but a clean DI, not an amp tone. Another thing you could do, you could take that clean DI, put an octave on it, either down or up, and then suddenly that can trigger a reverb. There's nothing more exciting than having like a low kind of rumbling DI going doo -doo 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 -doo, and have reverb on that. And that is menacing. Put that back underneath your original guitar sound and you've got this growling verb. Or the opposite. Take it an octave higher, put some reverb on it. Suddenly you've got this air sparkly verb that you can blend back in to your original guitar sound. It's a trick that I love to do and it has been in quite a few videos. I'll do a video on it another time. But that's to me is much more interesting ways of creating guitar sounds, especially when you, you don't have the ability to re-record the guitars. Somebody sends you something to mix and you maybe got one DI. You can start getting creative and doing all kinds of fun things. And pitch change is a lot of fun. All right, thank you ever so much for watching. What kind of ideas do you have for, for you know, making guitars sound more interesting? What ideas do you have for making only three-piece bands? I think only is a funny word to say, but that's why I threw it in. But you know, three-piece bands, making them more interesting. And last but no means least, do you have any secret guitars or secret instruments that don't cost very much, that you don't mind spilling the beans on and letting us know, you know, something really super cool and interesting you could use for recording. Check out Sonoworks. I'm, I have no affiliate, don't make any money from whatsoever, but I like the idea of Sonoworks. They are leveling the playing field. They are giving us the ability to use infinite different makes and models of headphones and speakers and get them to sound as flat as possible in your environment. So yeah, definitely check them out. Okay, so long, farewell, Auf Wiedersehen, au revoir, adios. Thank you ever so much for tuning in. Tschüss, goodbye.